Uh, Mr. Uh, Neil Trivet uh, from NVIDIA, uh, Vice President of Mobile Ecosystems, leveraging silicon acceleration for AR. So whenever you're ready, Neil. Cool. Thank you. So I'm Neil from NVIDIA, and I have a few minutes to talk to you about the state of the art on mobile silicon and hopefully inspire you because the silicon community has some cool stuff uh, coming, which we hope will let you guys create the next generation of uh, AR experiences. So my, my day job and NVIDIA is to, it's cool, it's to talk to developers that are trying to use visual computing on mobile devices using the mix of GPUs and CPUs uh, that we have now that can provide pretty substantial amounts of uh, processing power uh, even on mobile devices and if you analyze the kind of interesting pipeline of uh, applications uh, that are coming they all use the camera and it's not surprising when you look uh, why that might be because visual computing is interesting if you have lots of data to process, the parallelism, the high uh, processing throughput. But where are you going to get a lot of data on a mobile device? You're not going to pay for it on your data plan. You're going to get it from the camera, using the camera as a sensor. So computational photography, gesture, body tracking, uh, scene and object reconstruction, and of course, uh, augmented reality. This is the kind of things we want to enable people to use uh, the latest in uh, computing and the camera working together. And I think we're just at the beginning of figuring out how to use um, a lots of compute power in a mobile device to take AR to the next level. Uh, there's lots of great AR demos on the floor. Uh, this is actually a video from Ismar about 18 months ago, actually, that's doing way more than just the normal SLAM tracking and kind of the billboard augmentations, uh, doing ray casting into the scene, modeling translucent and transparent objects, modeling the reflections and refractions uh, through the scene, uh, high quality anti-aliasing. Now this is currently running on a laptop, so we're not quite there on mobile, but this is the kind of thing that we want to aim towards and hopefully after the next few minutes, next few slides, you'll begin to understand we're actually getting quite close to enabling this quality and this functionality even on mobile uh, devices. So I'm going to use, I'm trying hard not to make this a marketing pitch, but I'm allowed to talk about the chips from NVIDIA, so that's what I'm going to talk about, but hopefully extrapolate out into what's happening into the industry uh, in general. Uh, the, the NVIDIA's latest chip is called the uh, K1, the Tegra K1. Uh, it's a system on a chip because it has CPUs, GPUs, and a whole bunch of other circuitry that really means it's a complete computer on a single, single die. Uh, we have two versions, 32-bit CPU, 64-bit CPU is coming before the end of the year. So if you're wanting to use more than four gigabytes of memory, that limit is soon going to be shattered on mobile platforms as it was on PCs quite a long time ago. The key thing, as well as the CPUs, uh, we have desktop class GPUs now coming to mobile. In the NVIDIA roadmap, it's the Kepler GPU. Uh, we have the same GPU architecture now running from the highest end supercomputers all the way down to mobile devices. So certainly on the graphics processing, we, we kind of get getting you covered. You can do a lot of graphics processing on mobile. This is a reference platform. This is like a uh, tablet that's been dissected out. I call it the dissected frog system. Um, but we're running a high-end uh, graphics demonstration that used to need, need uh, 1.5 kilowatt PC with a high-end Titan graphics board. We created a mobile version of that same uh, demonstration. There are some sim simplifications. Uh, the resolution is slightly slower. The frame rate is only 30 hertz rather than 120 hertz. But the functionality, the core functionality is still there. We're creating lifelike uh, facial animation in this case. There's a lot of graphics performance, a lot of graphics functionality and flexibility that you've been used to perhaps on desktop PCs that are now going to be available on these mobile devices. So for the augmented reality folks here, this means if you're perhaps doing um, complex augmentations with Unreal Engine or Unity, I've seen lots of use of Unity on the floor, you're going to be able to do lots of cool graphics and it's not going to take so much of your GPU as it used to, so you're going to have more of the system left over for doing your vision and tracking and the rest of your application processing. So. I mentioned Tegra is a system on a chip. 
all of the, the chips that have been sold into the mobile space are systems on a chip. It's really everything you need to run a complete uh, operating system. There are a number of blocks that are relevant to the vision processing part of augmented uh, reality, because of course augmented reality is input as well as output. Um, we have dual image processors. Uh, we have the GPU, of course, that we can use for imaging. Uh, the video processor, normally it's an output processor uh, processing uh, HD video. We can use that for doing things like motion estimation. The nice thing about mobile SOCs as compared to PCs is that we have unified memory. We don't have a PCI Express bus that are separating uh, the CPU and GPU and the memory. So you can route data much more easily in a mobile system than you can on a traditional desktop. And this is showing how uh, on Integra, for example, we can bring multiple cameras, we can dump the images into unified memory. That memory that can then be accessed and processed by uh, dual ISPs, by the video processor, by the CPUs and the GPUs. You still have to be careful to use the APIs not to screw it up because you can allocate stuff that makes it hard for the software to know what you're trying to do. But if you're careful, you can begin to process memory and images coming from the camera with all these different processors with very little data movement and data copying. So the Kepler uh, GPU I mentioned is the same now GPU architecture all the way from the high-end Tesla products, which are the boards that go into supercomputers, down through G, um, Quattro workstations, GeForce graphics cards, and now uh, Tegra-based mobile SOCs. And in all of those markets, power efficiency is the key. Power efficiency is the new performance. It doesn't matter if you're trying to run in a a sophisticated AR app on a phone without it bursting into flames, or trying to pack the maximum number of gigaflops per cubic foot in a supercomputing facility, its power efficiency is key. And so all of the silicon vendors are working hard to give as much uh, processing performance as we can in the minimum number of milliwatts. And now at NVIDIA, now we have the same architecture. We can afford to amortize that uh, engineering uh, investment over multiple um, uh, uh, market segments. Vision processing, the power efficiency in particular, is really the key. And I think the main challenge that we have as a silicon community trying to serve the AR community, because we've just started on our vision processing odyssey, uh, we've been used to having a single sensor, we're now going to have multiple sensors, plot Synoptic arrays, uh, advanced sensors, uh, multiple sensors working in synchronization, active depth illumination uh, with IR sensors. Um, when we get to wearables, the vision processing is going to want to be on all the time, or at least appear as if it's on all the time. And all of this with a smaller battery and smaller thermal envelope than a mobile phone today, it's a real, it's a real challenge. We can load. Uh, the vision processing off the CPU onto the GPU. That, if you're lucky, that's going to give you 10 or perhaps more times power efficiency. But as we get new types of sensors, I think we're going to hear about that uh, later to, in this session, I think you're going to have even more processing to do. The mobile SOCs today have more space than we can afford to turn on all at the same time. So we have dark silicon. I think that's in the future, this is going to cause dedicated processors for these advanced 3D sensor types. All mobile SOCs have a dedicated hardware processor block for the traditional camera. It's called the ISP. I think we're going to have 3D ISPs coming in mobile SOC roadmaps uh, pretty soon. So that means you're going to have these dedicated processors. How are you going to program them from the software community and not have to program them individually for each different uh, silicon vendor? Open standards are the key. Um, those of you who know me, I love open standards. Kronos Group has an OpenVX standard, uh, which is for accelerated vision processing. Uh, the key difference between OpenVX and OpenCV uh, is that OpenVX lets you express a graph of vision operations. That gives the implementer of OpenVX the opportunity to optimize the execution of that vision graph, either compressing nodes together in a compiler or sending the image through the graph in a cached uh, format so you don't have to read write from memory. From the developer's point of view, if you want to do um, vision acceleration, using an API like OpenVX uh, will let you write 
code that will be easily portable with good performance across a wide diversity of processor types, everything from CPUs to GPUs to DSPs to, in the future, we're dedicated hardware that's going to do uh, magical sensor processing for you. At NVIDIA, we're actually using um, uh, OpenVX. We have a package of libraries and functions we call VisionWorks. Uh, it's based on CUDA because we offload a lot of the vision processing onto the GPU uh, using CUDA. But the developers can use, if they wish, just the OpenVX API and plug together lots of optimized primitives that we provide. Uh, NVIDIA also uh, puts together a bunch of sample pipelines, you know, complete mini applications that you can pick up. We are putting those into open source uh, for the developer community. You can make your own primitives. You can obviously create your own pipelines. And you know, we hope this will be a real uh, uh, enabler for uh, the augmented reality uh, community out there. So in summary, the vision processing is really driving all the innovative use cases in, in mobile. And desktop class functionality is coming to our rescue in the nick of time, coming into mobile. Uh, the new mobile form factors such as wearables, wearable displays, and new sensors are really going to drive the need for lots of advanced processing. And we're, we've had graphics APIs. We're now going to have vision APIs to let the developer community access that hardware. Thank you. Okay, questions for now. Ah. So, um, Open oh. TV is used a lot. Um, I think you mentioned it. Yeah, you may have mentioned. It. Uh, what, what's better, or what's what's on the horizon that you think uh, addresses a lot of the, the holes in, in in that framework? Yeah, no, that's Open TV is a is a great library. And uh, OpenVX that I mentioned, we're working hard to make it complementary to OpenCV. They're very different. OpenCV is a large open source project, which is great. It's a great kind of um, prototyping uh, sandbox. People, most people we talk to are prototyping with OpenCV, which is a great thing. But very few people actually ship a product with OpenCV. It's open source. It's, there's no specification. There's no conformance tests. You get the OpenCV from different vendors. It might behave differently. OpenVX is much smaller with a full spec, full conformance tests that can be reliably implemented across multiple silicon platforms. So we see that OpenCV for prototyping, OpenVX for um, the back end of prototyping and product delivery is actually quite a complementary pipeline. I think there's a question here. I'm just curious, do you see programmable fabric, FPGA fabric, coming to mobile SOCs anytime in the near future? Not to mobile. Um, I don't think the economics quite work out for FPGAs. But um, FPGAs definitely have market segments where they're ideally suited for, and uh, APIs like OpenCL uh, are now uh, being used, the uh, back ends for FPGAs, Altera and Xilinx are working on that kinds of stuff. Um, so for um, like, um, Head stations in mobile industry, no, actually no, in, in the tower rather than the device. Um, there are definitely applications for FPGAs that are using things like OpenCL. But for mobile, the power and the cost I don't think would work out typically. OK, and we're just going to limit it to those two questions because uh, we have to end at 5.15 sharp. So thank you, Neil. Um, and